So that's page 19 into 20. <clears throat> and before we get started, do I have a volunteer that will open in prayer? Then I am going to ask, Kevin, would you be willing to pray out loud? All right. Before we get started here, I'm just curious, overall, this is a bit of a longer chapter on Providence, and I think it's a good chapter. It's an important one. Um, just as a general comment or general discussion, is there anything that we're missing or anything that should require further explanation, questions you've had as we've gone along? Um, something that doesn't sit right, something that requires better explanation? Are we all tracking fairly well, or how is this going? We're good? Do we all agree with Yannicka? We're good? Yeah? Okay. Okay, because I, again, a discussion is good. Comprehension is what we're after here, not speed. So, uh, by all means... Stop me and uh, add, your, add your comments as we go along. <clears throat> so, paragraph four. The almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God are so thoroughly demonstrated in his providence that his sovereign plan includes even the first fall of every other sinful action of both angels and humans. God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by simple permission. Instead, God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs sinful actions. Through a complex arrangement of methods, he governs sinful actions to accomplish his perfectly holy purposes. Yet he does this in such a way that the sinfulness of their act arises only from the creatures and not from God, because God is altogether holy and righteous, he can neither originate nor approve of sin. Okay. So that's a long paragraph. How does that sound on first read? Questions about this? Does this make sense? What's a potential trap that we could fall into reading this? Or if you'd read this to a Christian friend of yours, what would be, what would be the pushback here? Who's, who's heard about God's sovereignty or God's providence when it relates to evil in terms of permission? No? Okay, I've heard it a fair bit that God allows or God gives permission for something to happen. Uh, and this is pushing back against that language, which, depending on how you hear it, can either be too strong or too weak. God gives permission for sin to happen. Well, what does that mean? If mom gives you permission to do something, are you breaking the rule if you do it? No, you're not. So in that sense, talking about uh, God decreeing sin in terms of permission makes it sound like he's okay with it. Okay? So if understood that way, it's far too strong. Okay? Um, so again, a, an example I always return to because it's helpful in my mind to understand this. Uh, we know in Genesis that God stops King Abimelech from committing adultery with Sarah. And then we know years later another King David does commit adultery with Bathsheba. Now could God have done for David what he did for Abimelech and stop him from doing this evil action? Yeah, of course he could have. So in that sense, God permits King David to commit adultery. Now, does David have God's moral stamp of approval? Does he have permission in that sense? So God didn't stop me, therefore it must be okay. Have you ever encountered that idea to sin? You know, kind of the ends justify the means? Well, something good came out of it, so I'm not morally accountable. Right? David got Solomon out of Bathsheba, so it's all good, right? Like, we're not going to worry about this. Was that David's attitude? Not at all. He was tore up over it. 
as he should be. <clears throat> the other sense, so okay, so can we see if we talk about God's decree when it comes to sin in terms of permission, it can sound far too strong. It could sound like God is okay with this. He's giving permission. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm talking now more, and we'll get to that. I'm talking now more in terms of where it's too strong, like permission. If mom says you're allowed two cookies and the kid takes two cookies, he hasn't done anything wrong. Because she's given permission. It's not a passive thing. She's saying, yes, you may do this. But what you're saying is what we need to get to next is if this word is too weak, that God just kind of takes a completely hands-off approach. Um, And so God, uh, there's not a design behind it. God's just kind of taking his hands off to see what will happen. Okay, And I think that's what most people have in mind when they hear about God allows evil to happen. He's just kind of taken his hand off the wheel, and now we'll see how this plays out. And we are dealing with very fine stuff here. When you deal with stuff like this, you should kind of come in dressed like the bomb squad with the wire snippers, because <laughs> you can really, it's like the Trinity, you can get into heresy pretty quick, no matter which way you go here, so please be gracious with me, because uh, this is bomb squad kind of stuff. Um, in terms of just allowing evil to happen, as though there's not a design behind a particular act of evil, if we think of what God is accomplishing through the adultery of David and Bathsheba, we all grant, can we all grant there's no moral permission here whatsoever for David and Bathsheba to do this? We're all good there? (laughs) Okay, so we've got the guardrail up on this side of the road, now let's put it up on this side of the road. Was this a random act of sin? Or is God doing something in the particular act of that particular sin? Which is it? He's working through it. Okay, and in this case, I maybe already gave away a bit of an Easter egg. What's he doing? Why David and Bathsheba? Why permit that adultery instead of adultery with a different woman or a different king? Why? What's he doing? See the problem here? He could have done this anywhere. If, so if we talk about just bare permission as though it's hands off, it could have been a different sin or it could have been different people. But in God's design, it was this sin with these people. Why? Did God want Psalm 53 in your Bible? I think he did. What kind of a man writes Psalm 53? Against you, you only have I sinned. I hate myself. Wash me with hyssop. What kind of a man writes something like that? A repentant adulterer. (laughs) Okay, so that's one thing. What if we, a few weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' family tree, and I don't know if you noticed, what I noticed, that there's some pretty unflattering people in there. There's lots of adultery, lots of murder, lots of Gentile women. Okay, is God telling a story with that? Okay, so is sin part of the design in one sense? So how do we understand this? We can't say God is uh, guilty of evil. God doesn't incline people to evil. Here's how I envision it, and this isn't perfect, but... I'll say how I envision this working, and then you tell me if this helps or not. If we have a biblical view of man, and that is a Genesis 6-5 type of view of man, that the intentions of his heart are always doing only evil continually. That's what the Bible says about us. We only desire evil all the time continually. Could Moses have made that statement stronger? The only intention of his heart was to do evil continually. Could you make that stronger? No. 
We are running by nature at every sin imaginable at 100 miles an hour, left to ourselves. We hate God in every conceivable area if left to ourselves. So we gravitate towards every conceivable sin at all times with all of our heart and all of our will. And now picture God's grace as a dam that's holding that back. Okay? The reason the world isn't worse than it is is because God's grace is restraining sin even in unbelievers. Okay? Hitler killed 6 million. Could he have killed 60 million? Yeah. Sure he could have. Okay? So God's restraining hand is even on evil men, keeping it from being worse than it is. <clears throat> now, if God decides to let certain sins through that dam, it's not just a random crack somewhere in the dam. He's letting it out a little bit over here, or a little bit over here, or a little bit over here to do something in particular, like declare Jesus guilty. Okay? Like betraying him for 30 pieces of silver. You see? So God... Uh, God's restraining all sin, and then if he, at some point in his wisdom, decides to let some sin through the dam here or here, that he's not pushing it through the dam, <laughs> okay? He's not the, he's not the source of evil, because he is light, and in him is no darkness at all. But the reason sin is showing up here, here, and here, instead of here, here, and here, is by his design, because he's doing something with sin in the story where it is. I'll stop there. Does that help to view it in that sense or no? It helps me. And I know if you push it too far, uh, any analogy runs into some trouble. But is that a helpful way to look at it? Or quiet? It does help? Because, again, the whole point of divine providence, of understanding it, both in our joys and in our struggles, is to see that we don't live in a random universe. Even sin isn't random. Okay? Sin is telling a story. Sin is doing something. So that when every tear is wiped dry in heaven, it all makes sense. There's no remainder. There's no loose ends that we're wondering about anymore. <clears throat> okay, so this is what is meant here by saying that his providence, his plan, does include sin. It's not simple permission, but rather it's by design that he permits it here, 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 and here, and not here, 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 and here. And yet God is never guilty himself of evil, even though he permits it. And again, another way to look at this that I sometimes think in terms of to pick up Howard's analogy if you give your toddler, let's say the toddler's old enough to understand instructions, and you tell that toddler six times in a row, don't touch the hot stove, don't touch the hot stove, don't touch the hot stove, eventually, what's the best thing for that child? He needs to touch the hot stove. That's the best thing that could happen to him. Okay? So if, if he's reaching his hand out, and mom doesn't stop him, does mom know full well what's happening? Could mom stop it? Did mom in her wisdom decide it's best not to stop it this time? Okay. Did mom force her hand on there? Is mom guilty of this? No, the child is. Okay. Mom didn't give moral permission for the kid to do this. Mom's not randomly waiting, well, I wonder what's going to happen if I don't stop him. Mom's doing this with wisdom, mom's doing this with intent, and yet the sin, the action, belongs to the one doing it, not to mom. Again, all things, all analogies with God run out to a limit at a certain point. But in our finite use of language, I think some word pictures are helpful. Well, I think so. <laughs> if she's going to use it wisely, I think then you sit down and say, see, mom's not so dumb. Mom, mom knows what she's doing. No. Well, after the fall, that's easy to answer. We did. Satan did, because we're fallen by nature. Uh, and that's a frequent thing as well. God planted evil in their heart, and we're saying, no, he doesn't. But,
And that's the point at which all theologians of every stripe have to say, we don't know. We have to uphold the biblical data. <laughs> then get to work and write a book. <laughs> No. And it is hard to swallow. But we have to think what's the alternative? Um and really, this isn't, well, I guess this is, the, the objections that naturally come up, one, I think we have to look back far enough, like you say, what are, what's the goal here? What's God doing? And it's to bring glory to himself uh, in redeeming people that are actually this corrupt. But to Howard's point, this doesn't answer every question. But again, really, that isn't even just an objection against a high view of sovereignty. Really, if you push that out all the way, it's an uh, objection to any kind of foreknowledge that God would have, right? So let's say now we're, you know, we're all Wesleyans and uh, we've done away with all this high sovereignty stuff, but God still has foreknowledge, and so we say, well, when sperm and egg we're going to meet, and this is Adolf Hitler, and God has the power to give life to it, knowing what will happen. <laughs> if God has any foreknowledge, he gave life to someone who was going to commit atrocities, right? So the, the objection is actually against foreknowledge. Why wouldn't God just not give life to that particular sperm and egg union, right? If he has foreknowledge of what this person will do, and God's not compelled to give life to every... Uh, to every union like that, no matter which, how we understand this, we're left with a question about evil. Right, but I'm saying even if we go with just bare passive foreknowledge, God's not involved in his creation, he's just watching it. What's that? We don't think that? I don't think that, no. But I'm saying that the objection to the presence of evil, all Christians have to deal with it. Whether you're Reformed, Roman Catholic, Wesleyan, whatever stripe of, of evangelical, or whatever stripe of Christian you are, the objection that you present is, it's a real question. And there's no, to my knowledge, there's no satisfying answer at least none that I have found satisfying. All I'm saying with that is, pick your branch of the church. You have to deal with, there's evil in the world, and God could stop it. Because all Christians believe God will stop it, right? All Christians, regardless of your eschatology, regardless of where you live in church history, all Christians share this view. Christ is returning, and all evil is destroyed. So then why doesn't he do it yesterday? What's that? The, this story does have to reach its climax, but what I'm saying is all Christians are admitting God can stop evil, and all Christians have to acknowledge he's not doing it now. So all Christians have this problem. Why is there evil that God could stop and he's not? And I think that's the weight of Howard's question, and I think it's real, and we have to be okay with it at some level. And that's fair. And he doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't give an explanation for the origin of evil. It, it really doesn't. And then, as Calvin himself said, if God is not pleased to answer this question, then let us shut our obstreperous mouths. <laughs> Calvin himself said that. 
Okay? If we don't have data, shut your mouth. And I don't want to do that because I want to... <laughs> I love logic. I want to understand it. But there's a point we get where we have to say, it's fourth down, we have to punt. Because I... Howard doesn't like punting any more than I do, I don't think. No, you don't. Okay, but you don't lose it. Okay, okay, and this is good. This is really good. Who can sympathize with Howard? We can't decisively answer the question of evil. Apologetically, that is a weak spot in our armor. Do we feel that? Okay. Here's how I would turn that around. We have a problem with evil. Yes, we do. Uh, but that problem only comes because we have a standard of good. <laughs> Your unbeliever has no problem with evil because evil doesn't exist. And he'll say, well, yeah, of course it does. I'm, I'm against rape. I'm against war. I'm against whatever. Why? That's where you got to play offense. Um, not that I need to convince Howard to play offense, but... <laughs> <laughs> but this is where you, you can be honest and say the Bible doesn't clearly lay this out. But you have a problem with good. You, tell me honestly why in a Darwinian system war or rape would possibly be wrong. They're good. It's the strong conquering the weak. That's how we advance. <laughs> this is literally the best thing that can happen is for strong people to kill weak people. Made is good. Abortion is good good. Rape is good in your conception. You don't have a problem with evil because evil is a, it's nothing to you. That's how I would push back. I'd rather have a problem with evil than have a problem with good. And unbelievers cannot answer how we know good from evil. They can't. How else do we play that? Can we admit that we have a problem with evil? that has yet to be answered. We're 2,000 years into church history. No one's answered this yet. Maybe it won't happen before Christ returns. Maybe it will. I don't know. But can we see then we have to say, yes, this is a problem for us in our finite minds, but the unbelieving worldview doesn't have this problem because they have a much bigger one. <laughs> Their whole world is irrational. We see that? More discussion on that? Then let's work through some of these texts. Who wants to take Romans 11, 32 to 34? Who's got it? Keith? Okay, Ray, was that your hand up? Then do you want to take the next one here? Do you want to take uh, 2 Samuel? And then who wants to take First Chronicles? Howard's got it? Okay. <clears throat> okay, Romans 11. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're not done yet. Okay, so can we see something of an answer emerges here? The reason sin is here is so that God can show mercy, so that's something of an answer. But clearly it's not a full answer because we're told essentially we can't be God's counselor. So there's something about this we can't understand that God does understand. Do we see that? See two things here? There's a hit and an answer, but it's not tied up in a neat little bow perfectly, with every question answered. Uh, to go back 
Yeah, and and as the, and has been pointed out, I think Doug Wilson uses this picture. Imagine Lord of the Rings without Sauron. Just hobbits in the Shire eating first breakfast and second breakfast, and they happily lived in the Shire forever. The end. Is that an interesting story? <laughs> no. What makes it interesting? Bad guys? <laughs> People you don't want to hang out with? Tension? Evil? Setback? Struggle? Pain? No. Oh. Goodness, listen to any music. There's three themes in music and art. Death, pain, and love. Why is that? Think about that for a minute. Why are those the only three stories in any song or in any movie or any story? They're the most relatable because that's reality. <laughs> right? What is life? Life is pain, Life ends in death, and there is a certain love and a certain glory that's imprinted in it. Okay? Break down any song, any movie, any story. That's literally, there's three plots available. And I would suggest because music is a recreation of God's original creation. And this is the kind of story that God wrote. So our stories will necessarily mimic the big story. 2 Samuel 24. Who had that one? Again, the angel of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and conquer Israel and Judah. Okay. Um, yeah, there's more to that story. I don't know how far we'd have to go. Remember, um, well, there's lots of places like this where God explicitly says something and then finally, given the hardness of the people, he says, yeah, go do it. Okay? Here's what's going to happen, Israel, if you want a king. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your young men into his army. He's going to take your young women into his harem. He's going to do this, 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 and this. Okay? If you want a king like all the nations. And what do the people all shout out with one voice? <laughs> Give us a king! <laughs> right? Right? Despite God's warning that their income tax may reach as high as 10%. Could you imagine? Could you imagine an income tax that rivals the tithe to God Almighty? Who wants to live in a society like that? 10% income tax. Wild. Ungodly. Okay? But so often... Um, Finally, God, to show what happens when we depart from his law, he, he lets these things go, and it's by design, and it's to teach us. Uh, First Chronicles, Howard, you had that one. Okay, so we just put those two together. Why did David take the census? Was in his heart, the devil enticed him. What was God's instruction? Don't do it. <laughs> Satan entices him. God finally says, okay, take the census, see what happens. Does anyone remember what happens? I don't think it's in our text here. What happens after David takes the census? Anyone remember? God gave him three options. You remember what they were? Um, uh, famine, yep. Yeah, it's three years of famine, so I'll kill you slowly. It's three months of being pursued by your enemies, kill you a little faster, or three days of pestilence. I'll kill you quick. Remember what David picked? Three days. Let's get it over with. Okay, this is a weighty story. Imagine you're representing millions of people and you just directly defy God. You cave in to the temptation in your heart to see how strong you are. Pull the calculator out because that's where your strength comes from instead of from God. And then you get a visit from God. You are responsible for these people. 
and now you pick the punishment. My goodness. And the, the reason David gives for that answer is that it's better to fall into the hands of God than into the hands of men. Right? He'd rather God just do this overnight in the camp rather than have some evil king chase him down and hunt him. This is heavy stuff. Okay? Who's held responsible for this? Who does David or who does God hold responsible? Does God say, I could have stopped you, David, but I let the brakes off here, so you're good? Not at all. David's responsible. David did it because he wanted to. All right. Let's keep going. Um, the next bit here. God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by simple permission. Instead, God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs sinful actions. Number 12. Uh, Second Kings. Who wants to take that? And who wants to take Psalm 76? Caitlin's got Second Kings. Who wants to take Psalm 76? Caitlin? Okay. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Kaylin. Okay. Doesn't sound pleasant, does it? You've gone astray, so I'm going to have to bring you back home with a bit in your mouth. Psalm 76:10. Okay, the remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. Okay, so what, what should we expect when we defy God's commands? Should we expect different than what these people got? Have you ever felt God's hook in your nose pulling you back after a season of sin? I have. And I am the kind of person who kills sin in my life very, very slowly. I don't know how many times the Bible has to say, don't be anxious, and guess whose head is always full with wondering how I'm going to lose the farm? What does God say? Don't be anxious. And then I do like David, and I don't trust the Lord. I trust my bank statement, so then I go see what my position is. I'm a proud man. I kill sin slowly. And then every so often, God has to make me feel very small, and his hook goes in my nose, and he's got to pull me back. I often think about the story of David, because that's exactly how I operate. Not with a large army. I deal with it with numbers on a farm. But it's the same thing. I trust my net worth. I trust land values. And I don't trust God. Anyone else relate to stuff like that? I'm assuming most of you are more teachable than me. No? No one else has to share. But this, I, I think, is a besetting sin, probably for more than me. But God, I always feel like he's got to let the rope out far enough with me for a little bit until I feel the weight of the sin in my heart. And then once it starts to tug, then I know I'm in for a little bit of rough water as I come back. Genesis 50, 20. Who wants to take that? And Isaiah 10. Who wants to take those two? Who wants to take Genesis? Genesis. And Evangeline, okay. And who wants to take Isaiah 10? I'm going to bug one of those teenagers over there. Who's the first to blank? Gideon is going to read Isaiah 10 for us. (laughs) 
Is that okay? Yeah, okay. I want to be careful who I pick on. Okay, I'll set the stage here for Isaiah 50, 20. Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery because they hate him. They want him dead because he's dad's favorite. So they sell him into slavery. And then remember, God brings his brothers back. They have no idea who they're dealing with. And then he wants to know how it is with his father. It's a great story. And then finally, once it's uncovered who all the players are in this story, then we get to Genesis 50-20. And whoever had that, please read. Oh, I think that might be a different one. I think you're at 21. Yeah. It was a good verse. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. So here we are exactly on the horns of this dilemma that we discussed. Is it sinful to sell your brother into slavery because you hate him? Can we all agree? You shouldn't do that? Okay. Do we all agree God holds the brothers accountable for their evil action against their little brother Joseph? And there was really no point to it, right? We know what the brothers are doing. What's God doing? From the standpoint of providence, why is it good that Joseph went to Egypt? To save Israel. To save Israel. Had he not been sold into slavery, he wouldn't have gotten to Egypt. He wouldn't have been promoted. He wouldn't have had the idea to save up food because of this coming famine and Israel would have starved to death. You meant it for evil, but I, God, meant it for good so that I could save you people. Go to the crucifixion of Christ. Is it evil to unjustly pronounce a curse on the Son of God and then kill him? Is that evil? Yeah, from man's standpoint, most certainly. Was God doing something good in that event? The word for this, and it always feels good to have a word because then it feels like we know what we're talking about even though we don't. The word here is concurrence, which means that God can will for something and man can will for something different in the same event. They both will the same event to happen but for entirely different motives. Therefore, you meant it for evil. You are accountable because in your heart was filled with evil. The brothers can't laugh it off and say, well, yeah, but it all turned out, right? So I'm not guilty. No, no, no. You sold your brother because you hated him, but God's doing something glorious here. Okay? And I'm guessing none of us here understand how that works. I sure don't. We have a fancy word for it. You can use the word concurrence, and then you'll sound really smart. But it's like the word, here's another one, energy. Everyone knows what energy is, right? Now tell me what it is. Now none of us knows. (laughs) We all know what time is until I ask you to explain time to me. Now none of us knows. Okay? We all know what concurrence is until you have to explain it. Well, it's like that. We have an idea, but how, how does this work? We don't know. But we know that it works. Can we at least acknowledge that? That God is willing good in the same event that men are willing evil. Can we at least see that much?
Yep. Amen. And that's a helpful picture. I'm pretty sure the pastor stole it from Jonathan Edwards because that's, <laughs> that's Edwards' thing. You zoom in close enough to any painting and it makes no sense. Take enough steps back and now you can see this isn't just random brush strokes. There's a, there's a story here. We see so little. Let's finish up here. Isaiah 10, 6. Just read 6 through 12. Okay. So there's God's hand of discipline working with unruly people. And then lastly here it says, <clears throat> Yet he does this in such a way that the sinfulness of the act arises only from the creatures and not from God. Because God is altogether holy and righteous, he can neither originate nor approve of sin. Who wants to take Psalm 50 there? Kenan? Okay, and who wants to take 1 John? Nathan? Okay. Psalm 50. Okay. You have done and I have been silent. Okay. There's an admission that we don't understand the full weight of things. We don't know what God is accomplishing. And then lastly, first John. There we go. So that answers where our sin originates from. There's, we often talk about sin as three places, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are our enemies. The world, because it has rebelled against God and is under a curse as a source of sin with its enticements. The flesh is our enemy because our flesh has fallen, and so therefore it wants the wrong things. And, of course, the devil himself can tempt us. Him and his army contempt us. So that's the origin of sin, and that doesn't answer the, the question that Howard presented. We still don't know how that works, but again, I want to say we have to go where Scripture goes. Um, any argument that has been raised to solve this problem, frankly, has fallen short. You can go the you know, the weapons-grade, hyper-Calvinist approach and say, well, no, I've got no problem with God just having created evil. There's deep problems with that. So I am an unashamed proponent of the theology of the Reformation, and I will happily say that hyper-Calvinism is not the answer to your problems. <laughs> okay? To say that God does evil and essentially say that we are robots Calvin himself did not hold that view at all. That's not the way to answer it. On the other end, the way to answer it, uh, the Arminian approach, which essentially throws it all to free will, is just as pointless. Why do people exercise their wills the way they do? It's still just randomness. Free will does not answer this question. It cannot. Why did someone exercise their will that way? in any meaningful way. That is not the answer to our problems. Free will solves nothing. It solves nothing. And it creates problems of human autonomy. Uh, and then another option is even more extreme on the free will side. is called open theism, where God isn't involved in this at all because God doesn't even know the future with certainty. So they'll take the Arminian argument, and I will give them credit for being consistent Arminians and say, well, if God infallibly knows the future, if God has foreknowledge, 
when we get up to the moment of decision, if God knows with certainty what we will choose, we still, the story is still written. We can't falsify God's knowledge with our action. And so the open theist will say, well, then we'll just get rid of foreknowledge. God doesn't know the future. He's in the system with us, processing this as we go along. And so God does not have foreknowledge. Uh, and that is just, again, right outside the bounds of Christian orthodoxy. That's not Christian at all. So the, the three main answers to this, proposed answers to this dilemma, all wind you up in the ditch. So we say, we submit to Scripture, and then beyond that, let us shut our obstreperous mouths. Obstreperous is an old-fashioned word for prideful, speculative. I'll stop here. Does that get us as far as we can go? Should we go further? Should we go less far? We don't want to punt on the first down, but can you see that we have to eventually say we, we don't know after a certain point? Are we okay with that? Is Howard okay with that? Hitchens? Dawkins? Not Christopher Hitchens. Well, he's been dead a few years. What's that? He died a few years ago, but he's fairly current. No, I understand. No, and I get that. I would just say again, childhood leukemia, we, he's using an emotional argument, and it's emotional for a reason. Because... Yeah. That's my, that's my, yeah. <laughs> Howard never likes to punt, even on first down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, I would just say, why is that a problem? In a materialistic world, we're just bags of mostly water. It shouldn't be an emotional problem. That kid means nothing in your worldview. With your assumptions, that kid is nothing. He's on the same level as a virus or as a coyote. Why does that kid's life have meaning? And I'd say the fact that it is an emotionally compelling argument I think you can use that to show that the image of God isn't Christopher Hitchens because he knows that child has value. But as soon as you try to explain to him why he knows that child has value, the reply will come back, shut up, is how he explains his position. Right? So I, w I, I don't think we have to give up those fights. I think even, even if we don't know fully, why is it a problem? We know. Leukemia didn't exist before the fall. We know that. We know it hurts. Because that child was made in the image of God. And death is a corruption. Death was never part of the creation. It's a curse. We can say that much. He has the problem of why does that child mean anything whatsoever. And there's that. Why are you angry at a God that's not there? Yep. But we should bring this in for a landing. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Father God, once again, we are confronted with things in your word that are simply too big for our small, finite, and even sinful minds to understand. I pray that we would submit ourselves uh, to that, that we would be okay with the unanswered questions, and yet that we would uh, never stop short of what you have revealed in your word, that you are doing good even through difficult, even through evil circumstances. You are accomplishing good. 
I pray that we would have a settled confidence in your word, even where it leads us into uncomfortable places or things that we don't understand. But I pray that we would then receive it by faith, trusting that you are working out your purposes. And I pray that this would actually serve as an encouragement for us to push back against the curse, uh, to bring your light, uh, to bring your law to bear in these situations, to show why we know things are not as they should be. Uh, and to be the salt and light that will push it back. Pray that you be with us now as we enjoy fellowship, as we enjoy some coffee, and as we prepare our hearts for worship. I pray that you would be glorified. We submit this time into your hands, and thank you for it. Amen.